Good day, this is Job Agos once again, and welcome to my lectures in Theories on Reality. And for this lecture, I will be focusing on St. Augustine, the most eminent thinker during the patristic period. St. Augustine was born in Africa. He was born to a pagan father and a Christian mother, St. Monica. St. Augustine was very much in, uh, interested in philosophy. In fact, he studied different philosophical schools, but he was not satisfied with these uh, different schools. So he searched for more, you know, for, for more knowledge until eventually he uh, discovered the works of the Neoplatonists and this really influenced St. Augustine's uh, career and thoughts. And St. Augustine later on would be converted to Christianity. He would become a priest and later on the Bishop of Hippo. And as a bishop, he would be one of the foremost leaders of the early church. So like the other fathers of the church, St. Augustine fused reason and faith and employed the philosophy or philosophy to explain uh, the Christian doctrines. His philosophical doctrines may be impregnated with doctrines of faith or his uh, philosophical doctrines were made attuned with his Christian faith. But one can still objectively distinguish his philosophy from his theology and his works contained a truly rational explanation of things. Of course, if we're going to uh, apply or if we're going to uh, analyze now uh, the thoughts of St. Augustine as to whether there is a, really a distinction between philosophy and theology or faith and reason. Well, of course, we can, we can say, well, his distinction between theology and philosophy is not really very clear distinction because at the time, the early fathers of the church, as we have said in our introduction lecture, still employ philosophy in order to explain uh, their their faith. But at the time, the time of St. Augustine, we can already see some progress of some or some development as to the uh, distinction between philosophy and theology. But of course, if you're going to apply uh, our standard today, that will not be, you know, that will not be very, very at par with our standard. Uh, anyway, so let's move on to, I already mentioned uh, philosophy and theology. So let's move on to the basic position of St. Augustine as far as philosophy and theology is concerned or belief and understanding, or we can say between faith and reason. St. Augustine, like his contemporaries, believes that it was the concern of philosophy to discover the way to wisdom and consequently to you know, show to people the way to happiness or blessedness, beatitudo. And this is the, the same goal of the Greeks, the Eudemian goal of the Greeks, to seek happiness. So the Greek ideal of eudaimonia actually uh, extended or you know, uh, influenced uh, the early Christians' idea of Less uh, of happiness. However, there is a big difference between the Christian and the non-Christian conception of eudaimonia or blessedness or uh, happiness. For the for Christianity, the ultimate uh, happiness is only possible through Jesus Christ. Of course, in the non-Christian they don't have that uh, idea of happiness being dependent on Jesus Christ. So for Christianity, the ultimate source of knowledge and truth is first of all the scriptures. And then of course, the authority of the, of the church or the tradition. So for St. Augustine, the scriptures supplanted the teachings of the philosophers as the right way to the truth. So, of course, you follow the, the philosophers, the Greek philosophers, and they would say that reason is the right way to the truth. But St. Augustine and the early fathers of the church combined 
that reason with faith and supplant that reason with faith and the scriptures as the way to the truth. But of course, reason is still there, but it now has a secondary, a secondary role. Now, belief in the scriptures is the first essential step towards truth and happiness or blessedness. So, uh, for St. Augustine, we need to believe first. We need to have faith in order to know the truth. But while faith is required of a Christian, it is not in itself sufficient for a full realization of the potential rationality of man. For St. Augustine, uh, he clarifies that while an act of faith or belief is an act of rational thinking, such, a, such faith is an imperfect and rudimentary kind. She said, to believe is to think with assent. And St. Augustine, and for St. Augustine, the act of believing is in itself its act of thinking and part of a context of thought. His Christian faith was really the first step on the way to understanding. But he never ceases to regard mere faith as only a beginning. Faith is only the beginning. To believe is to think with a sense, but that is just the beginning. That's not the whole, that's not the whole of it. Faith alone is not perfect. That's why he said this most famous exhortation of St. Augustine. Believe in order that you may understand. Unless you shall believe, you shall not understand. So progress in understanding, founded of faith, is and proceeding with its framework is part of the growth of faith itself. So believe in order to understand. And it's very important that we employ reason in order to understand. And therefore, we need reason to complement faith so that we can have a full understanding and appreciation of the truth. So faith alone is insufficient. It's just the beginning in order for us to understand. Now, the Neoplatonic influence. If we know that uh, as I already mentioned in the er, in the introduction, that the early uh, Christians, especially Saint Augustine, uh, were influenced by the Neoplatonic ideas or the, by the Platonic tradition. And he combined uh, his faith, his the Christian doctrines based on the teachings of the apostles and of course of Saint Paul, of course teachings of Christ ultimately, with philosophy or with the with Greek philosophy. So it's a combination of the Christian doctrines and Greek philosophy. But this uh, in in the, uh, the influence of Greek philosophy came in the form of the philosophy of Plato, which influenced other philosophers, interpreted this uh, the the Platonic ideas with some kind of a mystical, you know, uh, flavor, so to speak. And thus, you have the Neoplatonic philosophy. So, uh, Neoplatonism was the dominant uh, philosophy during the uh, patristic era, the, meaning the early, the, the period of the early fathers of the church. So, early in his philosophic life, before his conversion, St. Augustine studied, and as we have mentioned, he really wrestled with different doctrines, with different philosophies. His main pursuit is to find the truth. And the various doctrines in the schools during his time offered different notions of the truth. Now, the most notable of these is the Manichaean school, whose doctrine about the source of evil has consumed the thoughts of St. Augustine. According to the Manichaeans, there are two eternal principles, namely good and evil. The good is the spiritual, the, the good is the spiritual world of light, and evil is the material world 
of darkness. And these two principles struggle throughout human history. So for the Manichaeans, the spirit world world is good, but and the physical world is evil. So these are two uh, opposing uh, forces that struggle throughout human human history. Now, such ontology leads to a moral dualism. According to this dualism or dualistic framework, evil is a substance. Evil is a being in itself. It's a substance existing in itself that struggle with the substance of goodness in a sort of cosmic cosmic battle. Now, this framework raises two problems. First, the relation of God to creation and the problem of evil. How can an infinite God relate to a finite creation, to the physical world, when God belonging to the spirit world, world is good, but the finite creation is evil? Again, and second, so how, the, how, does, how can God allow this problem of evil to rule or to influence or to affect the physical world which he created? So the solutions are partly found in Neoplatonic doctrines. So St. Augustine found a solution to this in the Neoplatonic philosophy. But for St. Augustine, a Neoplatonic solution is in, uh, inadequate. It, it requires a Christian supplement. Okay. So, first, the Neoplatonic uh, doctrine or philosophy provided St. Augustine with a metaphysical framework of extraordinary depth and subtlety upon which the human condition could be understood. So, remember that in the Platonic tradition, you have the world of forms as the perf really perfect world. and the physical world is a copy of that perfect world. But it never regarded uh, the physical world as evil or as a substantial evil. Okay? So this doctrine can both account for the obvious difficulties with which life confront us. So since this is not a perfect world as the world of ideas, and so there will be some difficulty, some struggles in this world. Not necessarily that the world in itself is evil. So it also offers a ground for a Eudemian ideal, meaning it offers a ground where we can, from this uh, imperfection of the physical world, we can attain perfection or we can attain happiness. So it gives a clear account of a fundamental divide between the sensible physical world and the intelligible spiritual world. It also provides a unified hierarchy of beings which, uh, with absolute unity and progressively unfolds through various stages of increasing plurality and multiplicity. And of course, when it increases, when it increases in plurality and multiplicity, it decreases in perfection because the highest perfection would be the being at the top, and then when you go down, uh, there is a one being, and then when you go down, it multiply, they, the, the beings multiply, and then they become plural. And then, of course, as, they, as we uh, move down, the perfection decreases. So there's a certain degree of hierarchy of perfection here. Now, this culminates in the lowest realm of isolated and fragmented material objects which are observed by the senses now it becomes the physical world so there is a hierarchy of perfection the highest uh, there is a highest being and then uh, there is uh, multiplicity plurality and then finally in the lowest level of that hierarchy uh, of beings is the material objects that we find in the in the physical world so in this hierarchy God is the unchanging point, the highest point that unifies all, uh, all things, no? all things that comes after and below, uh, below him within an abiding and potentially, uh, providentially ordained 
rational hierarchy of hierarchy of being so that is what the uh the uh the main uh solution or the main doctrine of neoplatonism but aside from this conception of the intelligible world and the uh uh physical world the neoplatonist of course also said that the spiritual world or the intelligible world the realities that we find here are of greater value than the objects that are dispersed in space-time, meaning that are dispersed in the physical world. So, uh, St. Augustine took this as his starting point. That is the intuition of the intelligible world. So there is a physical world of forms and this is, and there is the physical world. So he took that as a kind of, uh, as, his depart as his starting point, the point of departure, as a springboard in order to know what the truth is. And that's how the Neoplatonic, Neoplatonic ideas or doctrines influence St. Augustine. Okay, of course, uh, underlying his, his uh, at this point when he was studying the, uh, the Neoplatonic, uh, the Neoplatonic uh, Neoplaton, Neoplatonic doctrines, uh, he was not yet a, a convert, but he was still grappling with the idea of uh, happiness, of perfection, of evil, etc. So, his theory of purification as necessary to arrive at the truth and his custom of progressively uh, elevating himself from an imperfect form towards the idea of perfection bears this influence of the platonic method so i already mentioned in the previous discussion that one of the uh, basic uh, conceptions in platonism which also influenced saint thomas later on is the theory of uh, Now, in order to arrive at the intelligible world, because this, that's the perfect, that's the perfect world, uh, man must purify himself or detach himself from uh, from the attachment to the physical world, from, to the to the to the objects of the, the physical objects dispersed in the physical world. So, uh, Saint Augustine's theory of purification becomes a it, it's necessary in order for man or for us to arrive uh, at the truth and this concept of purification goes through a progression of elevating oneself from an imperfect form towards the idea of perfection and this really is one basic influence of platonic ideas in the philosophy of Saint Augustine. So, Neoplatonism made Saint Augustine understood his faith, but at the same time, he transformed some aspects of the doctrines of Neoplatonism to conceive his own philosophy. So, Saint Augustine, uh, of course, he encountered the Neopla uh, Neoplatonic uh, doctrines before his conversion, but after his conversion, after he was already studying the Christian faith, grappling with it uh neoplatonism provided him with a kind of philosophy that he, that he will that help him enable to understand the christian faith that's why i always say that uh, the main influence of saint augustine are first the theology the christian faith based on saint paul's uh theology and philosophy from the neo 
uh, Platonist. Now, let's move now to the fundamental position of St. Augustine. So having said this, uh, how his philosophy emerged or developed, let's go now to some of the basic principles of St. Augustine as far as reality is concerned. But remember that, as we have already mentioned in our introduction, reality for uh, the, the patristic and the scholastic philosophers take, uh, takes a, a theocentric, a, a, a theological flavor. The conception is based on a God uh, oriented towards the relationship between God the creator and the world as a creation of God. So, the unique aim of St. Augustine is the conquest of the truth. We have been, so even before his conversion, he's been, uh, he's been struggling with the truth. And then, of course, of course, after his conversion, he would say that this truth is the subsistent truth. And this subsistent truth is no one else but God. So once he discovered this truth, now he, he, he found solace, he found peace. That's why he famously said in, the, in that book, The Confession, my heart is restless until it rests in thee. Meaning now his heart finally found rest in God because finally he discovered the truth. So uh, that consumed the life of St. Augustine, the quest, the quest for truth or the quest of truth. So it's, it's a question, it's a great question, which he sought to answer his entire life. Before and after his conversion, he was devoted to the search for truth. And of course, as we have already said, with the help of the Neoplatonic doctrines or Neoplatonism, he found the answers to his questions. But he, subs he substituted uh, the notion of the subsistent truth with, uh, to the transcendent and simple one of Plotinus. Because uh, I already mentioned this in the introduction, but just to connect this to this discussion, for Plotinus, there is a hierarchy of being. The highest being, the one that unifies everything, is the one, the transcendent and simple one. And then the one emanates, so by a process of emanation, it emanates into the nous or the logos. That is the, uh, the world of forms. It's equivalent to the world of forms of Plato. Okay. And then from this nous emanate the uh world soul the world the, the world the 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 world soul meaning the, the the universal the universal soul from where the individual human souls are contained and then the last is the physical or material world so you have one the nous the soul and then matter or the physical world now St. Augustine adopted this hierarchy of being, but he substituted the subsistent truth to the one or the simple transcendent one of Plotinus. And the, the logos that Plotinus is talking about, about the logos would be the, the intelligible world. He would substitute that with the ideas meaning the exemplary ideas, the divine ideas of God, okay? And then, of course, you have the souls, the rational souls, and then the physical, the physical world. So, the fundamental principle now of St. Augustine is that the divine truth is the unique and perfect cause, which is immediately explicative of all beings in its different, and their different modalities of nature and action or activities so god the divine truth is the perfect cause of everything and we can gain from him from understanding him an understanding of the many 
beings in the world, including their modalities of nature and activities. So, God is the source of everything and the source of our understanding, our understanding of these beings. So, St. Augustine's philosophy can be divided into these three main uh, these uh, three main parts. First one is a description of the existence of nature of the truth. What is this truth? Uh, that is his metaphysics, actually. And then the creative works of the truth. So the creative works, meaning what are the creative works of God? And then you have the descent of the truth. So two, two, two directions. First, the descent, meaning the, 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 the being, God, working through the hierarchy. And then the second is the possession of the truth, meaning how can man possess the truth? So if man is at the lower, God is here, he has ascended, made everything, and then God is here, or man rather is here. Then the second direction is the ascent of man to God. But this ascent would include the purification of, of man, meaning the attachment of man from the physical world, purifying himself, and then progressively or elevating himself until he reaches God. So that would be that would mean the union of God or union of man with God, where he will enjoy uh, eternal happiness, which is the ultimate goal of human life. So in this lecture, we'll just focus on the first. That means that is the the nature of the truth, the nature of God, and His. Uh, his works, the works of God, because that explains uh, reality, that explains metaphysics, plus of course his cosmology, but the second part, the ascent, is actually part of his ethics, which is not uh, already covered by our, by our discussion. So, St. Augustine proposes that every philosophy, so this, this part, I will be talking about the existence of truth, his explication of the intelligible world the truth. And part of that explication would be, of course, God. Okay? Because God is, uh, is the source of all these things. So anyway, so St. Augustine proposes that every philosophy begins with a clear and certain intuition of the intelligible world. That is, of a truth or an object of knowledge which reveals itself directly and in full evidence to the spirit to the mind to reason independently of the senses and therefore this truth is free from all errors so that's a kind of a rationalist stance right but of course uh he's getting that from from plato plato said that uh, knowledge should be true and rational meaning justified and the source of the truth is the world of forms. So if the world of forms is the perfect world and that's the intelligible world of Augustine, then that truth, that object of knowledge that we get, we acquire from that world of forms or the intelligible world in the case of Augustine is free from errors. Now, so here he establishes this by first defending it against skepticism by prove, by presenting two kinds of proof, the indirect and the direct proofs. So, of course, when you say there is truth, there is a knowledge that is, that is free from error, the next, the most immediate reaction would be a kind of doubt, a kind of skepticism. How could that be? How could be, uh, how could truth exist when there are so many, you know, so many falsehoods that we can, that we can perceive, that we can know? 
Now, the indirect proof of St. Augustine argues that those who claim that true wisdom lay in maintaining universal doubt, he is referring to the skeptics, in the speculative order and in regulating action, uh, are contradicting themselves. So those who doubt the existence of truth, okay, the universal doubt, in the speculative order and in uh, in action are contradicting himself. He said, how can one claim to belong to a school of wisdom, like the skeptics, and affirm that he possesses the truth, and at the same time, assert the impossibility of acquiring the truth? So if you say you, you, uh, is, you love philosophy, and philosophy is about wisdom and searching for the truth. How can you say you, you can possess the truth, but at the same time you say you cannot acquire the truth? So in this indirect argument, St. Augustine is actually saying one cannot separate wisdom from truth. For one is not wise if he is not or he does not know the truth. So the, the skeptics trying to search for wisdom, but at the same time they are denying the truth. So for St. Augustine, that is contradictory. But the direct proof of St. Augustine is this. It states that universal doubt is not only impossible, it is illegitimate. To prove his point, St. Augustine appeals to the testimony of consciousness, which attests to the existence within ourselves of an intelligible object under such conditions that error is impossible. So what is this intelligible something within us? He said, there are some contents in our thoughts which are unchangeable and they do not depend on concrete realities. For example, the rules of wisdom assist us to live, to live well through ethics and to reason well through dialectics. They express themselves directly to our intelligence independently of the concrete realities to which they apply. Likewise, the basic notions and the laws of numbers reveal themselves with the same independence of sensible realities, for they have properties which are completely different from such realities. So this is a classic actually a very a classic argument of the of the rationalists about the existence of something that is within us. And later on, when we discuss the modern philosophers, Descartes, for example, we will be touching on this because uh, the rationalist uh, follows the same line of thinking or line of argumentation against the skeptics. Then there is, of course, the intellectual intuition of our thoughts and of our own existence. And the, being most immediate and even discover, discoverable in doubt itself. Now, this is a classic St. Augustine's uh, quote. He said, if I doubt, if I dream, I am alive. If I deceive myself, I am alive. How then can I deceive myself in saying that I am if it is certain that I am? If I deceive myself. Therefore, there is an intelligible world which, though not demonstrable, establishes its own existence. This articulation of doubt as a proof for one's existence predates the cogito ergo sum of Descartes. So although Descartes is famous for the cogito ergo sum, the first articulation of this was actually made by St. Augustine in arguing against the skeptics. Now, let's go to the existence of God. The Augustinian proof of God's existence is closely related to his proof of the existence of the truth. So St. Augustine shows that the intelligible world does not only dominate the sensible and our reason, but is also divine. The intelligible world is divine. Here he would employ the method of Plotinus in order to mount to the creative source, meaning to God, to, to the truth, 
from the degree of participation found in creatures. Again, that idea of participation is coming from Plato. For St. Augustine, the end of philosophy is quest for God. So he begins his argument with the uncontestable truth, I exist. The reasoning soul, having established its own ex personal existence, then proceeds to search for truth and sees itself as intermediary between God, whom he seeks, and the material world. So the soul or man finds himself between God and the physical world. So man with his reasoning soul can also distinguish the diverse perfections of being in hierarchical order. So it's not just that man is situated between God and matter or the physical world, but because of his rational soul, he can actually understand. He can distinguish the different perfections in the hierarchy, in the hierarchy of being. So with these considerations, St. Augustine proceeds to argue for God's existence based on the existence of the sensible world and its perfections and the existence of the rational soul. So this is somehow related to the uh, cosmological argument where you argue for God's existence on the basis of what you see in the in the physical in the physical world or in the sensible world. Now, one of the principles that Saint Augustine employed to argue for God's existence is the principle of participation, which is also called the principle of perfect causality. Again, this notion of principle of participation is an influence of of Plato. It states that every changeable thing must be perfectible, and every changeable being must receive its perfection from a perfection that is immutable. So the perfection that is immutable is the cause, the changeable being that must receive perfection is the effect. Now, but every participation in the immutable and eternal, meaning God, supposes the existence of a source possessing it by itself absolutely, meaning by uh, this immutability and eternity. So if you assume that there is a participation to an immutable being, to a perfect being, then it goes without saying that there must be a being who is the source of this, because we cannot assume that there is a participation, but there is no being to participate with or participate to. So based on this principle, St. Augustine concluded that God exists. God is the immutable truth, the creative source of perfections and truth, upon which the created beings participate in their perfection. So nothing is perfect, according to St. Augustine, except through subperfection, And nothing is true except truth itself. The source of beauty, therefore, is the absolute beauty. And this creative source of truth, of beauty, of perfection, is God himself. Now, having established the existence of God, St. Augustine now focuses on the uh, nature of God. So, what is God? What is God? And St. Augustine, of course, uh, gives some of the, uh, the, the main perfection of God is that he is the truth himself. So God's fundamental attribute, his other attributes, uh, the validity of the knowledge we are concerning uh, him, they all uh, follow from St. Augustine's proof of his existence. And the fundamental attribute of God is that he is the subsisting truth, wherein all perfections are included and identified. Pretty much the, uh, the same as what Aristotle would say about the, the first mover, the first act as the pure act. There's no distinction. So he's perfect, he's simple. All perfections are contained in God. So God is the supreme truth. He's the source of logical truth of all our knowledge. He's the, the, the source of the ontological truth of the perfections of the world. By ontological perfection or ontological truth, we mean the truth of the creation, 
biological truth, meaning the truth about our knowledge. So each of these perfections expressed in a divine idea necessarily includes all the others and is identified with them. So we cannot attribute a perfection which is distinct from the others, for that would mean this perfection, with this perfection, that would make God better, which would mean that God is not really absolutely perfect because he can still be better. So God can no longer improve. God can no longer change. God can no longer be better because he is already perfect. If we if we accept that God could still be better or that perfection can still be added to God, then that means he's not absolutely perfect. So what are these particular attributes of God? First, that God is simple, simplicity. Because all perfections are identified with the subsisting truth or with God, then God is simplicity itself. God excludes all multiplicity and real distinction and composition. The second is unity. God has the fullness of unity because he is the only one. He is perfectly one and unique, meaning there are no other gods. Immutable. God cannot change. There is no capacity to receive or update any form or any kind of existence. Or, or any kind of perfection because he is not lacking in anything. He's not lacking in existence. He's not lacking in perfection. Everything is in him and therefore he can no longer change. Next is eternity. Divine immutability considered in relation to time is eternity. God cannot change. He is eternal, meaning he was not created. And he will never be perished. So, eternity is the simultaneous and immutable possession of every perfection. So, there is no past. There is no future. Everything is present. In fact, you, you cannot, strictly speaking, you cannot say God is present in the very strict sense of the Lord. Because that means it, you, you posit the idea that at some point he was not present. And then immensity. God is beyond space, for he is a non-extended and incorporeal being. Therefore, he cannot be, you know, he can, uh, be contained. No limitation. He cannot be contained in space. Now, let's go to the works of God or the works of the truth, the immutable truth. For St. Augustine, every sensible reality is but a reflection of God. In such a way that by studying the world under this view, we obtain the true science. And therefore, possessing the truth of faith and seeking to understand uh, this truth through philosophy, for St. Augustine, is very important. So we have to combine both faith and reason, belief and understanding. So St. Augustine uses the a priori method in explaining creatures through the influence of the creator. Of course, when we say uh, everything is a reflection of God, it does not mean that everything is perfect because it is a reflection in the first place. And a reflection is never as perfect as the original. And the farther you are, the, 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 the reflection, the farther the reflection is, the less perfect it actually becomes. So the farther a being is from God, the less perfect it becomes. So the first uh, principle that the, one of the principles that he applies here, the first one is the principle of emanation. What is the, how, what are the works of God, the creative works of God? He explains this by the principle of emanation. So what is this principle of emanation? It shows that God, since he is, he is the creative source, is this cause, the explicative source of all things. This principle is explained through the notions of creation, exemplarism, and providence. So we're going to explain this principle of emanation through these three notions. The first is the notion of creation. Creation is the act 
of bringing into some bringing something into existence out of nothing so through creation each of the realities of the universe depends according to their entire being on the subsistent truth or the creative source god so everything emanates from god as the creative source as the first source so something is a being something is one is true is beautiful or good because of the being meaning god because of the unity meaning god because of the truth because of goodness or because of beauty and all these are the properties of god however these perfections are realized only by way of participation so that the degree of realization of the perfection is not equivalent to the source itself since we only participate in the perfection of god in the beauty of god in the truth of god in the unity of god in the goodness of god we cannot have perfect unity perfect truth perfect goodness perfect beauty etc we only possess the creation the creators the beings they possess the perfection in a limited fashion so this participation is a creation that is it is an emanation of things according to their entire being it's a production ex nihilo which means the production from nothing so this is the strict sense of creation a production of the universe at the first moment before which there was nothing but god himself so the emanation of the world is a continuous creation it's a continuous creation and augustine explains this through conservation okay through conversation conservation so conservation is that through which things are dependent upon god not only at their beginning but even in their duration and unstable continuation this means that the created beings are not wholly complete and at best they're only reflections of god okay? and it's god who sustains them for their continued existence so god conserves them meaning god sustains preserves what he created so this is an example of a continuous creation god continuously create okay the the things the objects that he created and these things will cease to be if god will stop giving them sustenance or illumination and of course you're going to say well uh that means every day god creates we'll answer that later okay in the later part of our discussion the second notion is exemplarism exemplarism meaning model exemplar is a model as the subsistent truth god alone by means of the exemplar ideas is the immediate explicative source of the hierarchy of beings in all the degrees as we have already said the existence of exemplar ideas is a further consequence of the proof of god's existence resulting in the identification of god and the uh, ideal world so all beings in all their varieties they flow from creation through god so god for saint augustine possesses the ideas or intellectual images of all beings meaning everything is in the mind of god so those images those intellectual images of all beings are the exemplary ideas the models meaning when god created the world he has all these ideas all these you know images of being that he will create so he has a page on image of everything that he created these are the exemplary ideas so these uh, exemplary ideas are not only about the the generic uh the generic and specific perfections of every being that he created but it also text uh, tells us about or it also it, it is also about the final 
uh, an individual determination of its being. Of course, for some people that creates a lot of complexities because that means everything has already been determined by God, predestined by God because of his exemplar ideas. What about freedom? What about freedom of the will? Okay. So how does St. Augustine explain the freedom of the will? Well, just to answer that briefly, he gave us reason. So he figured in his mind what is human reason and what is the human intellect and what is human freedom. So what is freedom? Human freedom would include this idea of human freedom would include that man can choose whatever he wants to choose. And he may even choose evil. He may even choose evil. He may even choose to, you know, to, to commit sin. Of course, he wants us to be good. But because in his mind, this is freedom and freedom includes the ability to choose, then that includes choosing evil over good. Okay. Now, the last one is providence. By the very fact that God is creative, he is, of course, necessarily providence. Meaning, he is the conscious and benevolent source of order, of justice, and good in the things in the things that are created in the universe. So God is a source of order and good, perfectly knows the universe and its needs and wishes the goodness of his work. So his work is good. Now, again, the problem of evils come up. So, for St. Augustine, in principle, since every substance, every being is a participation in the sovereign good, which is God, it is necessarily good. It is necessarily good. Evil as such, as the, is, as the contrary of good, is, uh, cannot be a substance. Because everything that God created is good. And every substance is good. And good is a substance. So evil cannot be cannot be a substance. So how does Augustine explain evil? Evil is a limit or a privation of being, a privation of substance, a privation of good, meaning the absence, the absence of this, the absence of goodness, the absence of perfection. Its source cannot be God, for it lies entirely in the deficiency of creatures. So, therefore, there is no efficient cause of evil, but merely a deficient one. For evil is not an effect of an efficient cause. Evil is a privation. And as a privation, as a limit, as an absence, it cannot be avoided because once God created and what he created will always be lacking in something as compared to himself, there's already a privation at the very moment that he created. And of course, there will, for as long as when a being moves farther from the source, then there will be a privation, there will be a limitation and absence. Say, for example, in the case of light, if you are near the source of light, it's very bright. But you go farther from the source of light, the light diminishes. That's a privation. Until finally, when you're very far, it's already very dark. Or darkness. So darkness becomes the absence of light. Now, is the light the cause of darkness? Is it the efficient cause of darkness? No. It's not the efficient cause. There is a deficiency. There's no efficiency. It's a deficiency, meaning it's it's an absence. Okay? So, physical evil now, the first type of evil, is a consequence of a diminishment of being. And as such, unavoidable, unless nothing has been created. So, the only way we can avoid this diminishment or privation or deficiency is to not have created at all. So this 
diminishment, this deficiency is actually a, a consequence of, of creation. But it's not God who is the cause because it's not, as again, as we have illustrated in the case of light, light is not the cause of darkness. Now, moral evil or sin is the deliberate refusal to hold fast to the wise and good order of God. And as such, it is exclusively the work of man or the work of the freedom of the creature. God created man. He gave him his freedom. Freedom includes choice. So God will not give freedom and then determines everything that you're going to do. He created us with freedom and therefore we, 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 can, we can do a lot of things, including sin. But of course, God will always counsel us to do the good. So God cannot be the source of moral evil for its man because when he sins, well, it is he it's man who decides, who makes the choice. However, if we consider evil in totality, evil may actually contribute to universal harmony. For God has judged that it is better to draw good from evil than to suppress evil itself. It actually contributes to the good of the totality. Well, another philosopher Leibniz would have a very good explanation for, for this. So uh, we'll discuss that when we go to, uh, when we discuss uh, Leibniz. Now let's go to the next, uh, the corporeal world and matter, because this is, of course, one of the creations, the world is a creation of God. And matter is, of course, part of the creation of God, part of the emanation of God. So the most general and recognizable trait of the corporeal beings is their movement and continual transformation. This trait is explained by two principles, one of which is passive, that is matter, and the other one is the active, which Augustine calls the seminal reasons or sensual reasons. But uh, both of these partake in their own manner in the divine truth and therefore yielding, yielding another application of the fundamental theory of uh, St. Augustine by which he already explained in, different, in the different activities of the physical world. So matter is a reality that is absolutely deprived of any determination. So it does not have any determination. It is the last in the reflection of God, the, the farthest, the darkest, so to speak, in the source of the movement of time. But of course, although it is devoid of determination, it is capable of receiving determination. So it's not to say that matter is nothing. No, it's simply that it is does not have any determination, but it is capable of receiving determination or perfection, some forms of perfection. So the Gospel refers to the analysis of motion in order to explain the notion of matter. He said that bodies pass from one form to another through something which lacks form. That means matter. So matter is the receptive substrate of all forms without its possessing any of them. So it's like an empty vessel that there's nothing there, but it is capable of receiving many things, many, many different kinds of perfection. So it may be without beauty, without intelligibility, without unity, and without being. However, matter is necessary for the activity of creatures. It may actually partake of some truth and beauty, and it is the final or the last reflection of the truth. So yes, it does not have any any of this participation, matter itself does not have any of this perfection, but it is the sort of a receptacle of all these perfections. So since matter is the internal principle of the immutability of principles <coughs> of creatures, it is also the source of time. And time has no reality other than the present instant, which cannot be further divided into parts because the present does not endure. Okay. 
So, uh, now let's go to the rational soul. St. Augustine defines the rational soul as a substance endowed with reason and fitted to rule a body. Fitted to rule a body. Reason and fitted to rule a body. Again, uh, based on our discussion of, of Plato, that's very much, it's very much Platonic, especially the earlier, the earlier Plato, uh, Socrates. It is his use of the conceptual framework of this Platonic idea that made it difficult for him to treat man as a single substantial whole because of this composition. But he attempted to stress the unity of body and soul in man as far as his inherited conceptual framework allowed. So it is characterized characteristically platonic when he defines man as a rational soul using a mortal and material body. So that's different from the substantial, substantial union that Aristotle and again and later on Saint Thomas would be talking about. So the soul is one of two elements in the composite, but it is clearly the dominant partner. The relation between it and its body is conceived on the model of ruler and rule or of user and tool. So the body is just a means, a tool for the soul, because the soul is the more dominant component of man. Now, let's go to the uh, last two topics, and this is time and creation. The Manichaean, let's go back to the Manichaean, the Manichaean objection to the Christian doctrines of creation from nothing, had raised difficulties about speaking of an absolute beginning. According to the Manichaeans, there's no room for an absolute beginning of the of kind that, uh, that, that kind of beginning that the adherents of uh, creation of the doctrine you know, uh, uh, stress. We can always ask, uh, what happened before something else? Even if this was the first of all beginnings. It is rather arbitrary and absurd to believe that God made the world out of nothing. So the question is, what was God doing before creation? Why did he create the world when he did and not later or sooner or later? To answer this question, St. Augustine develops a critique of the conception of time that underlay, underlay them. Such difficulties arise from the fact that time is thought of as having the same kind of being as the events and happenings going on in time. The question, what happened before time, was thought to be of the same logical form as questions about what happened before any particular event. St. Augustine rejects this conception of time. He points out that whereas it makes sense to ask what happened before any particular event, it does not make sense to ask what happened before all events because time is the field of the relationship of temporal events and there could be nothing before the first temporal event. So there's nothing, we, we consider time as time here, but the, before creation, there was no here. So there was no time. So we cannot ask, what was God doing before he created time? We are, we are asking as if God is in time, but there was that conception of time is impossible. So he rejected the conception of time as something that has substantial reality of its own. For him, time is the field of temporal relations between temporal events. And prior to the creation, there was no temporal relations and there were no temporal events. God is outside time. So we cannot ask, what was God doing before, before time or before these things, this event happens? It's as if God is part of the event. But God is not really part of the event. Now, to ask, why did God, or why did God create the world at this particular time? Well, again, 
it's not it's not a good question because that means you again you put god into that framework of time so saint augustine went further in his reflections on time past and future puzzle him can what is not yet but will be and what is no longer but has been be said to be be said to be present if not then only the present has any reality but if only the present is real then reality shrinks to a dimensionless point and which the future is becoming the past following the platonic the new platonic position that thought had always treated time in close relation to the soul St. Augustine resolves the whole problem by locating time in the mind. But his position is not certain, and at the end of his discussion, he presents a definition of time as extension or distensio. I am not sure of what, probably of the mind itself. That's part of the confession. Okay, now, last seminal reason. So another question that the doctrine of creation raised for St. Augustine concerns the natural activity, the functioning and development of creatures. Remember that we have said that creation is a continuous cons creation. It's a conservation that God continually sustains what he created. Now this problem arose from the need to harmonize the story of creation of the world in seven days or according to an alternative version at once or whatever okay so uh or that god created the world at one instance the saint augustine solution to this problem lay essentially in asserting that god created different things in different conditions some left his hands complete and ready-made others in a potential or latent state awaiting the right conditions and environment to you know, for for their full development now this potential this latent state is likened to the seeds the seeds are thought of as con containing in themselves the fully developed plant in potency in potency and in this analogy he used the traditional vocabulary. St. Augustine called these potentialities for later development as seminal reasons, rationes seminales. So meaning when God created the world, there are things that he created already in its complete state. But there are also those things that he created in their potential state. So those he created in the potential state will manifest themselves later on because those are qualities are already contained in the seminal reasons and this is how god continually creates the world continually sustains the world in the in the potentialities in the seminal reasons that he put into the things that he created so he said in order to partake so in order that it might partake in the causality of the truth the world has received with its being the active principles of its ordered development meaning the the, the 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 potentials of its development so this order is however realized under constant dependence upon the divine providence so god continually observes continually you know sustains the things that he created while, of course, there are already things that he planted into the things, implanted into the other things that he created. So according to St. Augustine, at the moment of creation, the world received together with its being these seeds, these similar reasons, this what he calls the causal virtue or a power of evolution in which all future beings are already contained, not in a formal sense, but in a germ like a seed so these active powers are the seminal reasons okay? so as an analogy said as mothers are heavy with fetuses 
So the world is heavy with the causes of things to be born. Okay, so those are, uh, that's a rather long discussion on St. Augustine, but uh, somehow I, I hope I was able to present uh, a general overview of the notion of St. Augustine about reality. So thank you very much for listening.